2020 crazy, am I right? As it's been a rough year for most of us. Pandemic, travel restrictions, mega droughts, wildfires, racial injustice, protests, political unrest, and no new videos on my YouTube channel. So I'm ready to make a new video and get back into making weekly or bi-weekly videos again for you to, uh, to enjoy. Now, a lot of these events this year has made me thinking a lot about disaster taxa. So the word taxa is any taxonomic grouping of any rank, such as a species or family or class. So it can include a, a single species or a group of species. So in this series of videos, I want to explore what makes a taxa succeed when the world is going through apocalyptic change. Who are the disaster taxa? What traits or characteristics do they share in common that allow them to survive? And what can we learn about them to ensure our own long-term survival on Earth as a species? A disaster taxon is a species or a group of organisms that are found both before and after a major mass extinction event. They, they differ from other organisms in having the ability to make it through a very difficult geological period of time that actually led to the extinction of most of the other animals and plants that they live, lived alongside them. So what makes a disaster taxa able to survive? And are humans, are ourselves, a good candidate for a disaster taxa if we as a species are going to live through a mass extinction event on the horizon. Now, Roy Plotnick and Peter Wagner wrote a, um, a wonderful research paper a few years ago on a group of fossils that they call the greatest hits. And these are fossils that are both very common in the rock record and very long lived. Uh, examples would be the, the trilobite phacops that lived from the late Ordovician to the end of the Devonian, or the bivalve Inoceramus that lived from the early Jurassic to the late Cretaceous. However, many of these very long-lived classic fossil taxa did not cross a mass extinction event and were driven to extinction when things did eventually turn bad for them. In fact, it it's likely that very abundant fossils with long durations in the rock record is, is really due to luck or chance that is living during periods of time on Earth when not much happened. And the success of a species is really just picking the right time to live on Earth when you did not have to face mass extinction events like a meteorite impact or climate change or new invasive species. What I'm really interested in this video is those fossil species that survive a particularly awful, global, horrific disaster and how they manage to survive that disaster. Now the most famous and iconic of the disaster taxa I believe is a brachiopod genus, Linginia. Now, Linginia uh, likely arose during the Cambrian period, and it still exists in the marine seafloor muds today, what is known as lamp shells. It has two shelled halves composed of phosphatic carbonate with high organic carbon content, locking them in protected armor. They sit in deep, muddy burrows and open and close their shells near the entrance to filter debris out of the passing ocean water for planktonic organisms that they feed on. 
They also possess a distinctive feeding structure called a lophophore, kind of like a hand that catches and grabs this food. There's also a fleshy muscled stalk that anchors the animal into the mud. And when contracted, this muscle will drop the body down deep into the burrow, particularly when danger approaches. Now, there is some debate whether Linguinia living today in the oceans is of the same genus as the fossils that we find in rocks. But in truth, the burrowing filter feeding brachiopod niche is one of the most successful in surviving the numerous mass extinction events throughout the last 500 million years. Linguinia was one of the first survivors to appear after the end Permian extinction. And in my book, that's pretty impressive. Its success is often attributed to its burrowing lifestyle. That is having a fallout shelter that it can rely upon. It was in a sense, the ultimate prepper. But maybe we should also acknowledge its unique reproduction cycle that allowed it to succeed too. So brachiopods uh, reproduce by external sexual reproduction, where sperm is released at various times of the year from males and fertilize eggs in female individuals. These fertilized eggs hatch into very mobile, tiny larvae that swim in the water column. These lobate larvae swim around and uh, they're feeding on a yolk sac and they explore the marine world until they find a nice place to settle. And once they settle down, they undergo metamorphosis into an adult burrowing form. So this massive release of lobate larvae allows Linguinia to spread out into new regions of the ocean floor. And it's one of the reasons for their success is that they just don't just hide in a burrow all the time, but they can spread their population by these mobile larvae, um, a little like dandelion seeds do on land. Now, every day I run through this footpath and as I pass, I pass one of the great disaster taxa of all time. And this is actually a plant named Equisetum, the horsetail. Now this plant grows up through the tough uh, pavement and hard dirt and has a fossil record that extends all the way back into the Mississippian period where great forests of it grew during that long distant time in history. This noble plant fed some of the largest terrestrial animals that ever existed, the gigantic sauropod dinosaurs that lived in the Jurassic period. Now, Equisetum has also witnessed both the end Permian and end Cretaceous extinctions and has an excellent fossil record too. Now, Equisetum does have one weakness. And one reason that it's not found everywhere, especially here in the dry deserts of Utah. And that weakness is that it is dependent on water to reproduce. So these stocks are capped by a strombolus, which releases thousands to millions of spores into the air. So as this fantastic method of conquering uh, new regions by releasing those spores. However, the, the sexual reproduction, the trading of the gametes happens only during the wet season, deep down in the ground, when the water is flowing and that allows some of the swimming sperm to actually find female eggs. So the most interesting feature of this plant is its segmented stems, which allow the plant to break apart if nipped by herbivores without damaging the entire plant. And since the spores are likely to be carried even further in the gut of an animal, these parts of the plant are you know, expendable. The ancient dinosaurs likely spread this plant far and wide, but it was not entirely dependent on other animals for its survival, making it very successful even after the extinction of the dinosaurs. I have here in the lab another disaster taxa. 
These fossil clams were found in the same rock layers as the numerous bones of dinosaurs at Dinosaur National Monument in Jensen, Utah. These freshwater clams, they still live today, but are wholly dependent on another group of animals for their survival. These are the Unio clams, freshwater clams that survived the massive extinction of the end Cretaceous and outlasted the dinosaurs. They are remarkable because unlike the brachiopods, they need help from another group of animals. Such dependency means that both groups must be able to survive a mass extinction event. And the animals that helped these freshwater unio clams are the fish. Unio lives in rivers, and if it released a larvae like that simply swam about, like the brachiopods, they would be quickly carried downstream the currents, and the biogeographic range of the clams would diminish over time. What unio clams do is release larvae, which are hitch a ride in the gills of fish that move upstream, carrying these larval forms into new freshwater rivers inland. This allows them to quickly colonize new regions. Unio clams are very common in the fossil record because they are found in fluvial depositional environments where they're likely to be preserved, and they have not changed much since the Jurassic period 150 million years ago. Now, all of these animals and plants I've discussed are sessile for the most of their life. Um, but what about animals that move about the surface of the earth? One of the classic disaster taxa that made it through the end Permian extinction was a strange creature named Listosaurus. Listosaurus was a short dog-sized synapsid reptile that is a distant offshoot of our own branch of animals, the mammals. They have uh, shovel-like tusks that allowed them to nip at plants, like Equisetum, but they also lived in burrows where they could escape for long periods of time if necessary. Now, recent evidence um, published by uh, Megan Whitney and Chris Christian Sador suggests that these animals were able to go into hibernation for long periods of time, particularly in Antarctica, where long periods of darkness persisted for months and meant little food for them there. The ability to hibernate in a burrow, yet still have a supply of seasonally available food is an excellent strategy to survive a global disaster. This strategy is likely what allowed a closer relative to us to survive the extinction that killed the dinosaurs. By the end of the Cretaceous period, mammals had developed the ability to feed on nuts and seeds, as did several of the beaked birds that lived during that period of time. Seeds and nuts are fantastic sources of stored food that does not spoil easily and can be harvested and saved for later times when food is not easily found. The reason that most dinosaurs vanished may be related to the fact that the ones who did survive the impact of the meteorite uh, were the ones that had a source of food afterward, when forests were burned and there was a period of time with little for most animals to eat. Now, because the end Cretaceous extinction was such a rapid and quick extinction event, these animals could survive on the storage of food for a year or two and leave a new generation behind when food again became available. So we've seen some characteristics that make me want to live in a fallout shelter with cans of food, toilet paper, lots of batteries, and just fill it with stuff that I could use. Um, and that might be a very tempting way to survive a disaster, but it does not always lead to success, especially when dealing with dangers of climate change. 
So global warming and the desertification of regions of the Earth, a different adaptation is needed to survive these longer events. And that is mobility. So in graduate school, I spent several years studying how mammals respond to global warming events uh, that happened at the end of the Paleocene epoch when temperatures rose very quickly, um, about six degrees Celsius over a short span of time. Now, many of these mammalian groups that had survived the previous mass extinction um, that wiped out the dinosaurs, uh, including the multituberculates and plesiodapid primates, uh, these are fruit, nut, and seed-eating mammals living in the lush forests uh, in the late Cretaceous and, and early Paleocene epoch. Um, but when, with climate change, um, and with these forests being dried out and then catching on fire and then massive wildfires releasing more carbon dioxide, which made the landscape even more desert-like, and the quick emergence of the prolonged absence of trees that produced the fruit and nuts that they needed to survive. And these groups suffered greatly because of this most becoming extinct during this short period of time, even though they had an initial storage of food, it just didn't last long enough. The mammals that did survive the event were the ones that moved about the landscape. Uh, an example is the dog-like um, Ectation, which fed on grass and plants, but also was a very nimble runner. This animal, unlike the multituberculates and the plesiodapid primates, was not dependent on nuts and fruit in the forest, but could move to find more suitable habitat if needed. With some mammals, like Meniscatherium, a common mammal during this period of time, developing molars, back teeth, that allowed them to feed on tough grasses in the drier conditions, allowing them to survive and prosper. In fact, climate change seems to be unique in that the animals that survive are the ones that are most mobile, while other mass extinction events like impact events tend to favor the burrowing animals, the ones hiding in their fallout shelter. Now, the Triassic period, bracketing by the end Permian and the end Triassic extinctions, two really bad events, was a very long period of very hot and dry conditions for the planet. And it's not surprising that fast locomotion became a defining characteristic of the first dinosaurs during this time. Dinosaurs like the Coelophysids could quickly move around the desert-like sand dunes in search of water and food in a more desert-like planet of the Triassic period. Quickness and that ability to move allows groups to survive the nature of changing climates with its limited food availability, as well as widely spaced resources of water, which will become more and more scarce during droughts. So while it might be beneficial to stay hidden in a burrow, it also makes sense to move and escape a place when things get bad for prolonged periods of time. Um, because you might find a better place to live elsewhere as food and water becomes scarcer. So I think 2020, we've all felt a little like disaster taxa, both in trying to burrow in as well as staying mobile and able to move when danger comes our way. So I really appreciate your patience with these last few months. I'm finally back to making bi-weekly videos. Um, sadly, 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 no videos filmed in the field, but I'm hoping to continue to add to this channel as best I can from my, from my bunker here in Utah. Um, I'm teaching basically every day, every work day um, on the internet, so I'm always on air somewhere, but I'm hoping to squeeze in more recorded YouTube videos, likely on weekends. Um, my teaching and work schedule will be easing up here in November and December and January and into next year. Um, it has been a very rough summer 
uh, both from a mental way and having to cancel all the things I, I really, really enjoy about paleontology, such as field work and, and visiting new places to explore, but also having to work on a lot of things that came up with this uh, pandemic administratively with my uh, students and department, um, all of which limited really my ability to make any new videos to my YouTube channel. So I am so happy that you've stuck around and subscribed to this channel. And I hope to be uh, making more content to add to my YouTube channel uh, in the coming months and new year. So got that to look forward to. So thank you for watching. And definitely if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Bye.